because you are my king Jesus you are my king amazing love how can it be that you my king would die for me amazing love I know it's true and it's my joy to honor you in all I do I honor you in all I do I honor you what do you think of our new edition here <laughs> I'm this, old, I'm old, yeah. This one's, this one's a little peppy, so let's get ready. <laughs> Amen. Let's clap. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we are thankful again that we can come into this place and we know, according to your word, that we're two or more gathered. You're in our midst. We um, oftentimes sense that and we, we know that's just the presence of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and we're thankful for his presence in our lives. And so this morning, again, we... Uh, we not only want to sing these songs, but we want our hearts to be focused on you today. We want to worship you. So thank you that you're not only a holy God, but you're a loving God. You're a God who gives us grace. You're a God who's patient with us. And you're a God who has a plan for us. So uh, as we open your word today and as we spend this time together, we pray that you will open our eyes, our spiritual eyes. You'll uh, speak to us in a new way today where we just know that you're there and that you care. 
And so we give you, again, our lives, and we give you this time, and we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So before you go ahead and sit down, or we want you to move around just a little bit, welcome one another today to Grace Community Fellowship Church. We're so glad that you're here. We could uh, start to make our way back to our seats now. Let it happen. This, this This is the spirit moving through the body right now. Fellowship. So I prepared an extra long sermon for today. So... Morning. It's great to see everyone here today. I know it's, it's always wonderful to fellowship with one another, to be able to catch up, to be able to just encourage one another, and to, to be there for one another. So it's always a beautiful thing, these, these few minutes we have where we, we get together and we, we just fellowship. But I want to thank you for being here today um, as, we, as we celebrate God, as we worship Him, as we open His Word as we dedicate this day to him. Today is, is, a, is a special day, though. Today we have some extra reasons to celebrate, don't we? Amen. Amen. First reason we celebrate is because Christ is in us. That's first. But there's some other things going on today as well, if you haven't heard. Um, today it happens to be Mother's Day. If you, if, you, if you missed that on your calendar, your phone, your TV, everywhere else, today's Mother's Day. We want to we wanna really thank Personally, I want to thank the moms out there because you are responsible for growing that next generation. Um, we had a discussion in Sunday school today uh, before we actually started, and Dr. Ed even pointed out that uh, he didn't have a choice to, to be who he was, that his mom had instilled into him um, the foundations of faith. And it wasn't by maybe prodding and, and pushing, but, but as an example, um, she she led him to, to where he needed to be, and he, ne- he never felt like he was outside of, of that faith because of his mother. So from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank all the moms here. Um, I believe at the end of the service, we have something special for the mother, so I'm not going to do- spend a lot of time on that. We have uh, other things to talk about. Uh, we want to uh, be able, though, at the end of the service to, to celebrate the mothers here. And there's a third reason uh, that, that we're going to celebrate today. As I said, mothers are responsible for raising that next generation, right? And today we get to celebrate part of that next generation because we are celebrating the graduation of 
the class of 2022. And uh, so out of our church, we have, I believe, five um, young men that are represented by the families of this church that are all graduating high school, whether it be in, in Missouri Valley or, Lo or in Woodbine. And uh, so part of the, the service today, part of the sermon will be towards them as we, uh, as, we as a community, as a, a body of believers, send them out from high school into what we call the real world to experience life. And you'll have to forgive me if I get a little um, emotional or a little messed up on my sermon today. One of those five men is my, is my own son. So it's kind of different when you're up here and you're talking about an own family member, isn't it? it? It makes it a little more, I don't know, a little more emotion to it at times. But we'll try to, we'll try to keep on course and we're going to open up God's word today. This month, we're, we're looking um, at the quotations of a man by the name of Albert Benjamin Simpson, A.B. Simpson. And if you, if you didn't remember, he is actually the, the founder of our denomination. He's the one that started the Christian and Missionary Alliance. And so a few weeks ago, I was looking through my, uh, my books and uh, notes on A.B. Simpson and trying to find a quotation that, that would kind of fit today's feel uh, for the service because we're dealing with moms and grads, you know, those, those two together. And I found this quote. He actually wrote it um, in a series called uh, Christ in, it's called Christ in the Bible. And it's, it's Old Testament, New Testament. And this is volume three, which is on Joshua, which makes me wonder if he's only on Joshua by the third volume, how big of a series this must be. Hopefully it's alphabetically and not Genesis, Exodus, and he's only to Joshua. But there's, there's a lot that, that um, A.B. Simpson was able to find pulling Christ out of the, the entirety of the Bible. And this is what Reverend Simpson said. He said, God's word is not a cast iron system of theology proclaiming infallible security for any man irrespective of his own attitude, but it is the wise and loving touch of a mother's hand on the side of our spiritual life that needs adjustment. Whether it be encouragement to lift us up or admonition and warning to hold us back from presumption and disobedience. Those are the words of A.B. Simpson. I want to make sure that we understand one thing before I go any further. I am not preaching A.B. Simpson today. If, if you're new here, um, we, preach, we preach the gospel. We preach scripture. We preach God's word. If what A.B. Simpson said did not match scripture, I wouldn't be using it, nor would I be sitting here today. We would be in a church that did follow the word of God. So we're using this quote of Simpson's as, as kind of a, a framework, but we're looking into scripture. And I want to see what A.B. Simpson said in the light of scripture. And so we're going to turn to scripture and kind of unravel this quotation and how it applies to the moms out there and to this graduating class. The first thing we see is that theology may seem burdensome, but Christ's yoke is light. That's the first thing that, that Simpson said. He said that God's word is not just a cast iron system of theology. God's word is cast iron, isn't it? It is true. It is absolute. But it's not just that. It is so much more. And Simpson says that religion may be burdensome, but Christ's yoke is light. And to that we turn to Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. It says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Once again, A.B. Simpson started our denomination, but he's not the head of our church. Right, Jesus started the church. He is the head of his church. And that's who, who we look at. That's who is the, the focus of our faith. And he's also the point of our salvation through Christ Jesus. And Jesus says, this is, this is his words, to come to me, all who are weary and burdened. He will give us rest. For the seniors, I know Believe it or not, an old guy like myself, but I know high school was hard. I would bet, if you don't want to believe me, you can talk to anyone who's been out of high school for, I don't know, a year. And they can still relate 
and say, yeah, school was hard. Maybe not, maybe not the classes. Maybe you excelled in some of your studies, but there was a lot of other pressures that were involved in school. Social pressures, um, deadlines, just trying to navigate the world. So it, it can be burdensome. It can be difficult. And we look at religion sometimes the same way. But sometimes religion, we see that it's just a set of those rules, these things that we have to follow to maybe maintain our salvation or to, to be good enough to be accepted by Jesus. That there's so much that, that is just in the way that we don't really feel like we're drawn to religion. But it's not religion we're looking for, is it? It's a relationship with Christ. And in the Bible, as, as Simpson points out, the Bible isn't just this set of hard rules that you have to live by. The Bible is living and active. Scripture points primarily to one person. His name is Jesus. He's, once again, the focus of everything we do. And when we look at Scripture through the lenses of Christ, then we notice that he is there for our encouragement. He is there for our upbringing. He is there even for admonition, he is there for all of the things that we, that we face. And it's, it's not that we are legalistic and we have to be able to hit certain points and check certain boxes, but it's an opportunity to be brought into the family. It's a, a chance to be one of the sons and daughters of the living God through his son. This is where it starts. It's the relationship with Jesus. And for the seniors, this may be the very last time you hear a gospel message. Life is going to start to change, if it hasn't already. Uh, if you notice from a few years back or from when before high school, when mom and dad would drag you to church every Sunday, the relationship changes. And you begin to make your own decisions. And you begin to choose where you're going to be and what you're going to do. So this may be the last time you hear the gospel message. So we're going to make sure that we, we get it right. We're going to make sure that it's presented. And of, of all the, the speeches, of all the events you're going to go to in the next few weeks, I pray that just these next three or four minutes are the part that really stick with you, the part that above all else is stuck in your heart. And it won't be a beautiful speech by me, but it's going to be the words found in scripture specifically we're going to look at at the gospel of john and this is what he recorded christ saying john and this is a, a verse i'm sure you've you've heard or seen especially if you used to watch football and that guy named tim tebow john three sixteen and 17 for god so loved the world he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. I want to just tell Dr. Rudd that when I answered the question and I had John 3, 16, 17 on my mind, it's because it was physically on my mind and it took me a second to find another answer to your question. But there is nothing short of Christ that can save you. And I know that, that as Brad pointed out, all of our seniors today are, are males. They're these strong, athletic, energetic, powerful males. They're going to go great places. They're going to do great things. But, but even on your best day, even your best efforts, there is nothing you can do to make yourself right with God short of accepting Christ. And it's, it's usually a message that, that if you're not ready to hear, you don't want to hear. But it's the truth. And it's important. And once again, I pray that's, that's the one thing, if, if nothing else, that you, that you remember that you take from this. See, Jesus, like you said, he tells us his yoke is light. It's not, it's not this iron set of rules that you have to follow. You have to eat or refrain or do or not do. It is a relationship. There's no list of things you have to accomplish in order to have that relationship with Jesus. For me, there was a, a specific 
scripture that I'm going to share with you that really changed on how I thought about Jesus and a relationship with him and what it would be like to have that relationship. And this is Ephesians. This is one of my all-time favorite verses. Chapter 2, verses 8 through 9, it says this. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God. Not by works so that no one can boast. You've probably got a lot of trophies in your room. You probably have a lot of accolades and certificates and whatnots and knickknacks and maybe even a letter jacket with medals on it. You may have been the smartest person in your class and wore a the, the extra cord for valedictorian, those are works. We're not saved by works. We're only saved by believing in him. The gospel says that if we uh, believe that, you know, God raised Jesus from the dead and then we proclaim him as the Christ, then we're going to be saved. And this is, this is it. That is the gospel itself. It is simplified. It is secure. And it's an easy yoke. That was what Simpson had to say. I think uh, the other part of it, though, the next thing that Simpson had is, is not just that the gospel scripture is more than ironclad. It, it says that attitude and actions are important. And I think that's one of the things that school tries to teach you is that attitude and actions are important. I'm sure during this graduation season, you've probably seen or heard one of these scripture verses. Um, in fact, I know that for my son, one of his best friends has it written on his, uh, uh, his uh, um, invite to his party, and it comes from Jeremiah 29, Jeremiah 29, 11. But I want to put it in context, um, Jeremiah 29, and we're going to read 11 and 12. When Jeremiah wrote this prophecy, it was to Jews in exile in Babylon. And before Verse 11, I think just in verse 10, he, he says that you're going to spend a total of 70 years in exile. So Jeremiah wasn't saying, hey, things are going to be great and happy and perfect and it's going to be instantaneous. He's saying, hold fast. Things are going to be difficult, but hold fast. Jeremiah 29, 11, two, 11 and 12 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. That, that 12th verse is really important to me because it's not just that, that God's going to lay this out and it's going to be perfect and it's going to be with, without struggle. No, chapter or verse 10 says that there's going to be a lot of struggle. And verse 12 says that when that time comes, you will call on me, you will come and pray to me, and then I will listen to you. The whole purpose of Jeremiah 29, 11, and 12 is to say that in the midst of our struggle, God still has a sovereign plan for our lives. When things get difficult, he is there. We just have to turn to him. And it's an encouragement to those that are facing difficulties. Again, to those young graduates, you're going to find yourself in a new season of life. High school is over. And... The real world, as, as us old fogies call it, will soon begin. And it's not a threat. It's, 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 a, it's a reality that each of us, each and every one of us has had to face at some point, where we, we go from being a youth to being an adult, where we are responsible, we have our freedoms, but with that comes those responsibilities. It's not just car payments and cell phone bills. It's not just insurance premiums or house payments. It's your spiritual life as well. Like I said, mom and dad aren't going to drag you to church the same way they used to. You might not even be living here. You may be on the other side of the earth. Who knows? But your parents will still encourage you to stand firm in your faith. And while this is happening, your friends, your classmates, your colleagues, society in general is going to try to pull you in a different direction. It's going to try to pull you away from this relationship with Christ. They're going to try to take you away from what you've been taught to believe. As Stan said when he was talking about his mother, the, the way she instilled it into him, there, there was no other option. 
but the world's going to try to change that option. And one of these temptations you're going to face is to just put your, your faith on a shelf to just forget about it for a little while. Because there's so many other things going on in the world. It's no longer a top priority as you experience life. But life isn't that much different than high school, is it? We still have homework due, except we call them deadlines and payments, right? We, we still have competition, but it's not on a wrestling mat or a football field. No, it's do I get to have the job? Do I get to continue to provide? Do I get to be promoted or will I not have a job tomorrow? And this is why we start to place our faith on a lower priority because the weight of the world is down upon us, but the light of Christ, the, the, the yoke of Christ is light. And instead of turning away from Jesus, I encourage you seniors, and when I say seniors, you know that I'm not just talking to them, but I encourage us to instead of turning away from our faith, to really dig into it, to turn towards our faith. Because that's where we're going to find the encouragement we need. That's where we're going to find the hope we need. That's where we're going to find sometimes the energy we need to face those struggles. Because at some point, things are not going to go as planned. At some point, it's going to be like Jeremiah is speaking to the Israelites and saying, you know what, you still got a ways to go. But I have a plan. God has a plan, and it is for you to prosper. It's for him to not harm you. And if you turn to him in prayer, if you give yourself to him, then you will start to see the change. See, it's not that we have hardships that's important. It's how we react to our hardships that people just, we call it character. It's how we respond to our environment. And sometimes, if you're like me, you fail miserably at it. But sometimes when we turn to God, then things go right. Things are seen differently. People notice the difference in us. You know what God notices too because he's not looking at your face. He's not looking at your Facebook page. He's looking at your heart. God knows exactly how you feel. God knows exactly who you blame. God knows exactly who you're giving your struggles to. Because, see, salvation just isn't this, this plan for a future time in heaven. Jesus wants us to be transformed and new here on earth and enjoying the promises he has today. Even in the midst of the 70 years of struggle, even in the midst of whatever you're facing, today he wants us to be full of joy and hope. He wants us to in, in be in, in the middle of his promise. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4 says this. It says, Since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. There are so many directions that the world is going to try to take you. Most of them, I would argue, are not the right choices. Most of them are directions away from God's plan and his will. But when we follow his lead, then we start to discern his will and we're able to follow his plan. Romans 12.2 says, Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to, to test and approve what is God's will his good, pleasing, and perfect will. See, God's word provides us with wisdom, with encouragement, and it also provides us with warnings. Our, ser our sermon today is, is a little short because we have all these things to celebrate, but mostly we want to celebrate God. We want to put him first. And we want to make sure that as we send these seniors out that they have just a little bit more knowledge than they came in with, right? It's not much different than school. Not much different. God's word guides us in wisdom, encouragement, and warnings. Hebrews 4, verses 12 through 16. Let's start off with the first two verses. For the word of God is alive and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's light, from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him 
whom to, to whom we must give account. Let's, let's pause for a moment before we continue on in Hebrews. In Simpson's quote, he used this imagery of a mother's hand, right? And I, I want you to think back, especially you seniors, since this is your last week of school, I want you to think back to your, your first week of school, kindergarten or preschool. Think way, way, way back then. More than likely, mom was holding your hand, wasn't she? Yeah, because it was a scary world out there. And mom held your hand to encourage you, to let you know it was going to be okay. That she was proud of you, that you could do this. Mom also held your hand so you wouldn't go out in the street and get hit by a car. Both were happening at the same time. Whether you were getting on the bus or whether you were walking into the school, mom was holding your hand. And the purpose for her holding your hand was simple, because she loves you. Because she wanted to see you succeed. Because she had plans for you to prosper and not fail. And she wanted to keep you safe to the very end. God's word is, is a lot like that. It's a lot like that. Because everything that God is doing for us is out of love. And sometimes we think, well, things are going great. I'm, I'm in, in the fullness of love of God. And sometimes things aren't going so well. And you know what we should think? Right now, I'm in the fullness of the love of God. Because he is holding my hand to keep me from further harm. I'm reminded of... Uh, what we call the love chapter in the Bible, and it's not on the screen. First um, Corinthians chapter 13, where it talks about what love is, and we know that, that God is love. But it says, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It, is al it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love isn't just being happy when you're happy and, and patting you on the back. Love is holding your hand and keeping you out of the street, no matter how much you want to be in the street. Love is admonishing you when we make mistakes. Love is being truthful. Love is saying you need to change your ways. You need to look at yourself. You need to rethink your situation. And that's what love does. And as we continue on in Hebrews, it talks about this, that through Jesus, there is, there is a special love that he holds for us Continuing on in verse 14 of Hebrews, it says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Jesus understands our situations. He has been tempted harder than we could ever be tempted, and yet he never sinned. Being, the, being God in the flesh, he chose to come to earth and humble himself to death, even death on a cross. So that at the name of Christ, every knee should bow and every tongue would confess that he is Lord. And this same Jesus that is this powerful, omnipresent, omniscient, perfect being is also our friend. When we turn to him, we can turn to him with our struggles. We can turn to him with our joy. We can turn to him with anything that's on our heart. And he is there for us. And he is holding our hand. Sometimes he's encouraging us, patting us on the back, saying, you got this. It's okay. Sometimes he's holding our hand so we don't run into danger. If you've been listening, which I hope you have, you know that this message isn't just for seniors, right? It's for all of us. Because all of us face the same struggles. It doesn't, it doesn't change. All of these things I talked about where we have bills and we have society around us, this, it's every one of us. Because life changes, difficulties arise, Right? 
Life can be frustrating. Life can be discouraging. It can be disappointing. Life can be downright depressing. But as A.B. Simpson pointed out, and more importantly, as Scripture points out, God's Word reaches into the hearts of believers and guides them. Just like Mom used to do when she would hold your hand. If you think back, Mom kind of exemplified that Kenny Rogers song, right? you got to know when to hold them, know when to scold them. Or wait, my words might not be perfect, but the Word of God is, right? But that's what, mom, that's what mom does, right? She knows when to hold, she knows when to scold, but it's always done through love. Now you got the song stuck in your head, don't you? I apologize. God's the same way as mom. He knows when it's time to admonish. He knows when it's, it's time to lift you up. He knows when it's time to just be with you and crying. He knows how to share your pain. He knows how to share your joy. He knows all these things. That quote from Simpson right after um, the part that I read, he continued on when he's speaking about the way God deals with his, his children. He says, It would have been as cruel and unwise to encourage David in the time of disobedience as to have discouraged Simon Peter when his heart was breaking with the remorse and sorrow. The one needed stern rebuke to let him see his sin, and the other needed hope and comfort to reveal to him his Savior's mercy. I find that important because we always need one or the other, don't we? We need encouragement or we need discipline. Most of the time I need both. Never forget that mom is always there for you. That's, that's what she is. That's who, that's who she is. That's what she does. It's in her DNA. It's how God formed her. She's nurturing. But she has limitations. Moms won't be around forever. Sometimes moms just physically aren't there, depending upon where you are in the world, depending upon what you're doing. Mom's heart's with you always, but mom might not be there. But Jesus, Jesus is always there. No matter where you live, no matter what you do, no matter your career, it doesn't matter. Christ is in the midst of us. And so where we would turn to mom as a youth and we'd ask her to hold us and ask her to comfort us, Jesus is the ultimate comfort. He is there at all times for us. He's there to love us in our time of need. So as you take your final walk down the gym floor next week to you seniors, as you enter into life, the adult life, the change in life, I, I, I just ask you to place your trust in Jesus. It's more important than math, history, chemistry, welding. Christ is eternal. So whether you find yourself in college or starting a career, or taking a gap time, or learning about yourself, or in the military, or once again living in a completely different hemisphere. It doesn't matter. Jesus is not bound by physical space. Trust in him. Give your heart to him. Understand that in the, the joys and in the troubles and in the trials, in all things, we can turn to him. We can give him our praises. We can give him our hurts. And he, he gladly takes all of them. And he is there for us. He's there to encourage us. He's there to admonish us, to guide us, to lead us, and to watch us grow, just as mom did. See, that's the most important lesson a student should learn before he graduates. Trust in Jesus. Let's pray. Lord God, we, we thank you today for your word. We, uh, we come to you and, and we just, we praise your name. We thank you for this ability to, to be in a church together, to celebrate mothers, to celebrate seniors, to celebrate 
life to celebrate you. Even on a dreary day like today where it's, it's wet and dark, we know that this is part of your plan to bring forth life. And just as, just as we have difficulties, we know that you use it for, for the good of your people in all things, that we would turn to you, that we would seek your face, that we would call on you by your name. So we ask that you would ordain these, these young men who are graduating high school and, and for all of their classmates and friends, that you would reveal yourself to them, that they would know you are the living God, that they would turn to you in their, in their time of need. We thank you for the mothers that are here that have raised up the next generation of believers, ones that we, the, the mothers that we can always turn to, always ask for that hug, always ask for the kind words, and always ask for truth. And we find truth in your word, Lord, and we, we thank you for it, and we, we turn to you, we give you this day, and we praise your name. In Jesus' name we pray today. Amen.